Welcome, everyone. I hope everyone's having a wonderful time at Comic-Con here on our today. I hope everyone's had some fun panels, despite the miserable weather. Um, this is fan art. Teaching it is okay. My name is Katie Sika. I kind of started this whole panel actually for the Art Educators Association, first for Connecticut, and then I tried to get it in for an EA. To my left here. Hi, my name is Janine Sapphire. <laughs> and then we have at the end. I'm Rachel Branham. And so uh, just a quick little overview. I've been an art educator for about 10, it was actually my 10th year. Um, so yes, I'm not in single digits. Uh, I teach, uh, right, currently right now I teach pre-K to eight. And I question my sanity many days. <laughs> Um, I'm also a art artist out. I am I'm also a fan artist as well. I go to conventions, not as big as Comic Con, and I actually do go and sell my own artwork. And then a little bit of um, for yourself. Hello, uh, I am too a artist from Artist Alley. I also am a YouTube personality as well. Um, I do a lot of fan art. I am not a fan artist by trade, but I am a working artist. Um, I currently teach at a uh, public high school in northeastern, or northeastern Massachusetts uh, high school right now. Um, this is my 11th year, so wow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but I also am a big fan of comics, I'm a big fan of all fandoms that exist here, and I truly support fan art in a lot of like meaningful ways, so that's why I'm thrilled to be part of this presentation today. All righty. And so, just to give you guys a really basic overview of what we're going to be talking about here. So, we're going to talk about several different aspects about fan art and the best ways to kind of approach it with children as well as teaching it to children. We're going to talk about some of the brain approaches, some of the psychological effects, as well as, especially for our older students, knowing the legality of some of this. We all have, obviously, our own experience with students as well as fan art, both professionally and personally. Just to let you guys know, this is a lot of our kind of personal opinion as well as research. We're obviously not trying to sway you that all fan art is good or anything like that. You know, we just we're just hoping to open up your mind to this new route and you know make sure that you understand that while there is some negative, there can also be a positive. Okay, so with that in mind. Now let's begin with just something that I actually found when I was first coming up with this presentation um, a couple years ago that I found insanely funny. So it's, it goes, I hate when people go, I don't credit fan artists as real artists because it's fan art and they should draw more original art. Yeah, okay, that's patronizing attitude. It's nice and all, but every classical piece of art is fan art of the Bible. So you can go and turn to the last supper doesn't count as real art because it's not original and you can make some receipts. I think I just found the most compelling argument for fan art ever. <laughs> Which I fully agree with. Think about it. So Rachel's gonna start us off with the brain approach. Alright. Hey friends, good to see you. Alright, so here are some nice some relics from my own childhood. <laughs> um, so I've got a nice collection of uh, the classic Universal Monsters having coffee, and also a kind of amalgamation pool party with characters from South Park, Foxtrot, Sanrio, like Kuropi's there for some reason, Batman, Superman, etc. Um, and a lot of these younger um, art pieces that I made are about me coming into my own personal style, but also through replicating other styles, and that's a big part about what I talk about here. Um, and I just want to also say that you're going to hear a lot of similar things echoed through myself and my co-panelists. So um, it's very exciting. We all have good things to say. Let's begin. Uh, let's start with drawing on the right side of the brain. So the name is a little misleading. Um, it's been previously thought that the left brain and right brain hemispheres worked independently, and they all had, or they both had different ways of um, being responsible for different functions. Where the left brain was supposed to be more analytical, the right brain was more conceptual, but recent developments have shown that that's not actually the case and that both hemispheres work in tandem. Um, but when I say drawing on the right side of the brain, what it really means is 
that it's um, isolating and creating a separation about the way that we think about the objects that we draw. Um, so it's a method of drawing that uh, takes steps to remove emotional noise from interpretation uh, of our ideas about objects and instead look for concrete shapes, lines, and structures from direct observation. Um, so it's kind of like when you draw a character from memory versus from direct observation. And this obviously goes to a much larger place beyond just drawing characters that are already made, but again, we're kind of circling back to the fan art part of this. Um, so it, in a way, it is like copying, um, and it helps artists to build uh, a sense of awareness in their drawing practice um, as they draw more representationally, uh, think about how the lines intersect and connect to form a whole. So that is uh, the gestalt theory, right? How parts of the uh, individual parts create the greater whole, and being able to denote some of those things is an important theory of visualization and conceptualization that has to be strengthened through opportunities that students have, such as these. Um, so a good example of drawing on the right side of the brain is the upside down drawing, which um, is basically when you take a drawing and you orient it in a way that changes uh, and abstracts it a little bit, and that way it further removes the artist from, again, that emotional noise about what we think of this interpretation. Um, so instead of looking at uh, a man, you would instead just see shapes, and you can really look more closely at some of those fine details, and uh, it forces you to draw the image exactly as you see it. Um, this is a practice about shifting states of cognition and awareness through the literal or named states, creative and abstract states, uh, and in a way it helps to build a more mindful and meditative practice for drawing as students engage with it more deeply. Um, so relating to motivation, um, catch up with the okay. uh, <laughs> so part of the recognition of this shift in drawing is about feeling attuned to the practice and the process, uh, separating oneself from the burdens of negative inner dialogue or learn to perceive failures as an artist. Um, if you're not an artist, I'm sure you would be really happy to tell everyone, like, oh, I'm not an artist, I can't even draw a stick figure, right? <laughs> so being able to have some success and to find some uh, you know, joy in the things that you're doing, and especially in this um, vulnerable creative space, is really important, especially as students learn how to um, you know, feel more comfortable with themselves. Um, so finding success in this practice is inherent to attaining and retaining student motivation, uh, which is where the true learning occurs. Students will not learn if they don't want to, as we all know. Um, one of the quotes I have here, students will uh, students need to feel successful and to make progress, and they also want to have fun with their friends. And that's from a Harvard uh, think tank called Innovate, um, which talks about uh, kind of the ways that teachers and other school officials can utilize student motivation in a meaningful way to help them gain more, uh, feel more successful at school. Um, clearly another reason to let fan art drive the boat is to capture student interest, right? It makes them feel successful them together, you make a nice piece of fan art, you get to like feel proud about it. Um, it's not just about self-esteem though, it's also about um, referring to true accomplishment or achievement in something tangible. Um, so another quote here, piece of evidence, uh, relates more to the neuroscience side of things. Um, solving problems brings pleasure. When I say problem solving, I mean any cognitive work that succeeds. This is a sense, there's a sense of satisfaction, of fulfillment, and successful thinking. It seems undeniable that people take pleasure in solving problems. It's notable, too, that pleasure in solving the problem, uh, that there is pleasure in solving the problem. Working with a problem with no sense that you're making progress is not pleasurable. So if you're continuously beating yourself up over doing the same thing again and again and again without feeling successful like you're making progress, it's going to create discouragement. It's going to make students feel less uh, engaged in the process and so on. Um, when students first practice and hone their observational drawing skills, the process can be challenging, especially as the students get so utilizing familiar characters makes this process easier and it feels safer. Uh, engaging with familiar figures and forms provides a comfortable starting place for students and allows them to feel some of those happier connections to their work, which makes them more invested in the process. Because there are going to be a lot of students a lot of times that, you know, as they go along with fan art, they're going to wander and try and perfect everything. This is something that all of us have probably seen, you know, whether you're an art teacher or not, if you see a student who's kind of doodling, and they're trying to draw their favorite character, you're gonna see them kind of keep going at it, going at it, going at it, until they actually can get it right. And in that sense, you know, that's their own sense of achievement and, you know, trying to make sure that they get the proportions right, they get the coloring right, they get all those other aspects right. And it's their own joy in seeing them get it, that, you know, they feel successful. Um, so, additionally, um, the practice of creating fan art can also help students to learn new styles of drawing and therefore new ways of seeing the intricacies of lines and shapes to create meaningful images. Um, this can be especially valuable to students who feel stuck in a particular way of seeing and drawing. I know I've had a 
lot of students who feel like there's only one way to do the drawing all the time, and it really limits them in terms of where they can go creatively and conceptually. Uh, one interesting study on the creativity of copying styles comes from researchers, oh gosh, sorry, Kentaro Ishibashi and Takashi Okada from the University of Tokyo. So this is a, an image from their study and a, a quote from their study as well. And the study revealed that over the course of three days, student artists who spent more time replicating other artists' styles first would later create artwork that demonstrated more aesthetic attractiveness, originality, and technical skill than those who did not practice through copying first. Quote, another explanation of this relationship between copying and creativity, as revealed by a post-test questionnaire, is that copying work forced participants to consider the form and style of the artist as well as their own. Copying pushed participants to compare their own style to someone else's and allowed them to think through aspects of their own drawings that they might not have otherwise questioned or considered. Good copying is not simply about getting the line or form correct, but about questioning why an artist is thinking a certain way and what they were thinking as they were working. Ultimately, this exercise generated new ideas. So uh, I also want to speak a bit about my own experience as a high school teacher working with art schools and colleges. Um, so while colleges don't necessarily want to see fan art in a freshman portfolio, um, the student artist who has become more confident in their work over the years through practicing, connecting with, and responding to their favorite artwork will be better equipped to build and produce a good portfolio. Uh, students who pursue creative careers, also in uh, commercial arts, will need to learn to replicate certain styles in order to be successful. So thinking about people who work for Disney, for Marvel, and so on. And Katie can speak more about that from her own uh, experiences. Yeah, so the thing is, this is something that also got me thinking with the idea of fan art, is I've actually worked for several different animation companies prior to this. <coughs> I worked for Frederator previously, I worked for uh, animation ne uh, Next Network uh, in New York, and I actually did work on one of their shows called Captain Monkey for uh, for a couple months. Um, when I was going for an animator's test, they sent me a bunch of scenes that were unfinished, and the idea was I had to replicate how the character would look doing these movements. So I had to study the character sheets. I had to look at previous scenes that they sent me that other animators had drawn. I had to make sure I had. I could replicate these flawlessly. At that time, I had only been working on Captain Mikey doing very limited with um, what's called shadow work, where I would go through frame by frame and add in shadows to specific characters. <laughs> and honestly, like while that's exceedingly tedious, um, it does give you an idea of the sort of thing that you need to be able to do, because I also had to go talk to um, other animators who were, or other shadow artists who were basically bookending the same scenes um, that I was doing. Because at the beginning of Captain Mikey and at the end of Captain Mikey, um, they show the same sort of scene. And so I had to see what the same what the other person was doing in terms of their shadow work in order to know what I should be doing for my shadow work. And so when I was doing that test, I was trying to think, see what everyone else had been doing and trying to make sure that I got these movements right and that the Arms look the same, the face look the same, everything else had to look the same. Because I'm part of an assembly line. And that's something that we kind of forget about when we see some kids who are doing fan art. If they want to go for Marvel, if they want to go for Pixar, Pixar excuse me, if they want to go for any of those, they've got to work their way up the ladder. They're going to be part of an assembly line. They need to adapt their style in order to make it work. So it's one of those things where while we might discourage it, it's actually a 